For more than a century, um, Gornia has been one of the key sites for understanding Minoan urbanism. By the end of the neo-palatial period, the excavated se section of the town covered some 1.68 hectares. The town consisted of a number of interdependent uh, components, including approximately 66 houses, a small palace, harbor facilities, a platea, and a cobblestone street system. In this paper, we will examine how the various components of the town interacted from the time of its foundation in the pre-palatial period into the neo-palatial period. We believe that examining the diachronic formation of the town will provide us with a deeper understanding of the development of Gornia as an architectural and a social community. Although there is some evidence for Neolithic activity in the Gornia area, specifically as Fungaris, the first permanent settlement dates to the pre-palatial period. During this period, early Minoan two to three burials appeared in rock shelters and inhumations as Fungaris. Middle Minoan 1A burials continued in the area in Pithoi. A second cemetery on the northern spur of the Gornia Ridge included both burials and rock shelters and one built tomb, House Tomb 3. House Tomb 3 continued into the Middle Minoan 1A period and five additional house tombs, 1, 2, 4, 7, and 8, were constructed at this time. Recent excavations in this area confirm that these were the only tombs constructed here. The contents of Gornia's house tombs included numerous prestige objects, include, um, indicating the elite status of the deceased. Until recently, the pre-palatial settlement at Gornia had mostly been inferred from deposits beneath later houses. The Gornia excavation project, however, has identified at least two pre-palatial buildings. We found the remains of a poorly preserved early Minoan III building on the, on the northwestern side of the ridge. An excavation in room 20 of the palace brought to light a middle Minoan 1A cobble pavement covering an area of at least 92 meters squared. Below the paving are the remains of a large, lambda-shaped stone platform constructed on top of bedrock. This platform may have been built as early as the early Minoan II period. The platform and the cobble pavement were covered over by an extensive leveling fill of small, water-worn pebbles in the middle Minoan 1B, if not by the end of the middle Minoan 1A period. In summary, the pre-palatial sediment was divided into three distinct spatially separate dis districts, the Cemetery of Fungaris, the cemetery on the northern spur of the Gornia Ridge, and the settlement itself. The different burial types and mortuary assemblages indicate disparities in the socioeconomic standing of some groups. We might infer that at least six elite groups, i.e. those using the house tombs, were living at Gornia at this time. Finally, the large cobbled pavement beneath the later palace may represent the earliest community-based construction within the settlement. Although there were hints from Boyd Haas's excavations of, a, of an extensive proto-palatial occupation on the Gornia Ridge, the actual evidence for this was limited. Sporadic burials continued both in this Fungaris cemetery and in the house tombs of the North Cemetery. Boyd Hawes also excavated protopalatial deposits underneath later houses FF and EL, deposit A on the eastern slope, and south of the later public court. She also concluded that houses AA, EK, and a house beneath neopalatial house CA were constructed during this period. Despite these modest remains, Watrous's recent survey of the Gornia area showed that the protopalatial period was a time of major growth and change. The settlement extended from the Acropolis to the coast, along most of the Sfungaris Ridge, and to the adjoining hill on the west bank of the Gornia River. Recent excavations have also improved our understanding of the proto-palatial town of Gornia. In the northern area of the site, we have confirmed that wall XX, a large retaining wall constructed of cyclopean blocks of white crystalline limestone, was constructed in the middle Minoan 1B period. The massive pottery dump in the North Trench was also deposited during this period, not the early Minoan III period as was once thought. Indeed, the North Trench deposit may have been the result of clearing operations in advance of Middle Minoan 1B constructions elsewhere in the settlement. We have also uncovered several protopalatial structures to the west of Wall XX. One of these, the so-called Pit House, was a freestanding building consisting of four communicating rooms. The north wall, which forms the building's external facade, 
differs from the other walls of the pit house in that it was constructed of rough cyclopean blocks of white crystalline limestone. This facade would have been visible for some distance to the north since excavations have confirmed that the area north of the pit house was uninhabited. The pit house was accessed in the protopalatial period via an east-west street that we will describe in a couple minutes. To the south of the pit house, a conglomeration of four buildings, which made use of one large north-south running spine wall, was also constructed in the Middle Minoan II period, if not earlier. Most of the buildings in the northwestern area of the site were abandoned at the end of the protopalatial period. On the slope east of Wall XX, our excavations revealed a small complex that was used in part to manage um, runoff water. We uncovered one room, three large connected basins, a number of channels cut into the bedrock, an open court, and several terrace walls, all dating to the protopalatial period. A section of a north-south paved street ran underneath the later neopalatial North Ridge Road. A leveling operation consisting of small water worn pebbles was initiated in the middle Minoan 1B period in the area of rooms 18 and 20 of the later palace. A northeast southwest ru uh, running retaining wall labeled Haas's wall on the plan here was constructed to contain the le leveling fill on its southern side. Room A, a freestanding square structure with low ledges lining its walls was then constructed up against this retaining wall. Room A was used only for a brief period before being backfilled and abandoned early in the protopalatial period. Although we do not understand the purpose of this strange little building at present, it does provide us with some useful chronological information. No monumental building was constructed in this part of the later palace site until after Room A was abandoned in Middle Minoan 1B. Moreover, evidence from five trenches laid out in various areas of the platea suggests that it was not used at this time. Indeed, Room A may have marked the southern limit of the protopalatial town. The introduction of Cyclopean masonry, as in Wall XX and the Pit House, marked changes in social complexity. As the earliest form of monumental architecture at the site, it served as a symbolic manifestation of the power of the sponsoring groups and a demonstration of their power to marshal the people and material resources necessary for their um, construction. Cyclopean facades visible from the streets and from the surrounding countryside made the social hierarchy within the town visible. Boyd Hawes thought that all of the Cyclopean masonry at Gornia dated to the second half of the town period when she wrote, there was increased mechanical skill among the people or some social change that placed the labor of the many at the bidding of a few. Her dating has been accepted by Souls, Zelensky, and most other writers. We are now able to distinguish two distinct styles of Cyclopean masonry at the site. These two styles are distinguished from one another in three ways, the kind of stone used, the sources of the stone, and building techniques. <clears throat> Protopalatial cyclopean masonry consists of large irregular blocks of white crystalline limestone. Too brittle to hammer dress, the large stones were irregularly placed and the spaces between them were filled with smaller stone wedges. The stone is the same white crystalline limestone that forms the bedrock spine that runs through the entire length of the town. Some of the building stones probably came from within the settlement but some of them were probably brought from the small hill just south of the site where the bedrock um, strata have naturally split into rough blocks of appropriate size. In this plan, we see the distribution of the white cyclopean masonry. Fragments of monumental houses remain in blocks D, E, and F. Wall XX, the north facade of the pit house, and the north end of the shore house and the harbor area were also built of white cyclopean masonry. The most extensive sections of white cyclopean masonry are at the top of the Gornia Acropolis, forming the north and east facades of the palace. Boyd Hawes dated these massive walls to the late town period. She specifically remarked that the east wall of the palace reminded her of the double town wall at contemporary Philocopy III in Milos. In his careful re-examination of the palace, Sold agreed that most, if not all, of the eastern section of the palace was a later addition built for defensive reasons to enclose the summit of the Acropolis. 
He pointed out that the great tower, that is room 35 at the palace, interrupted the course of the East Ridge Road and cut off access to the northeast corner of the palace. Therefore, the great tower, in his opinion, had to post-date the use of the street. We see the situation differently. Our excavations within the tower showed that it dates to the Middle Minoan III um, period, providing a terminus antiquum for the white cyclopean masonry that it was built against. In addition, below the neopalatial floor of the Great Tower, we found a small protopalatial room that had been destroyed by the construction of the tower. And finally, in the area immediately south of the Great Tower, we uncovered one large Middle Minoan III deposit associated with the construction of the tower itself. The neopalatial street that Souls thought had to predate the construction of the tower seems to have been constructed in late Minoan 1b after the Great Tower had gone out of use. In the protopalatial period, the southward continuation of the East Ridge Road was further to the east on the, low, on the lower terrace. The early street ran along the east facade of the palace until it eventually joined East Ascent C. The craggy, white cyclopean walls that form the east, north, and northwest facades of the palace represent a unified structure that was eventually incorporated into the later palace. We think that these walls are the remains of a protopalatial palace. The earlier palace would have looked remarkably different from the later building. It was perhaps roughly square and did not extend so far south as its successor. It straddled the summit of the highest part of the town Acropolis like a fortress, its rugged white masonry visible from a considerable distance. When the massive walls became part of the expanded later palace, their appearance, their appearance of aggressive strength was lessened. In his, in his recent dissertation on Minoan street systems, Gomri describes the variety of roles that streets play within the larger urban fabric. They were not only for communication within the town and providing access to the houses, but they also provided light, air, and drainage. Perhaps most importantly, they served as vital areas for social interaction. Gomery also discusses what he calls the chicken or the egg problem in Minoan urban development. Which came first, the town buildings or the street system? Boyd Hawes saw the development of the neoplatial buildings and streets as a continuing organic process of interdependent components. Some houses belong to a rev relatively early stage of the neoplatial period, while others, such as in Quarter D, were abandoned before the rest of the town. Hawes thought that the constructions of the streets was simul similarly gradual. Later writers have interpreted the situation differently. In 1970, Brannigan proposed that most of the streets of Neopalatial Garnia have been laid out originally in the protopalatial period before the Neopalatial town grew up. The pre-existing framework of the streets divided the town into six insula. Like Brannigan, Souls thought that most of the Neopalatial street system followed the lines of an earlier protopalatial street system. Souls concluded that the earlier town resembled the later town except that the earlier town lacked a palace and a large platea. Souls's view became the default interpretation of the site. Unfortunately, however, no one has offered a clear explanation of how or why the protopalatial streets came to be constructed in a period that was once thought to have preceded the construction of the first monumental houses and the palace. Who would have organized the building program, recruited the labor, organized the construction, and provided for the upkeep of such an extensive network of streets. An elaborately paved street system as extensive as the one at Gornia presupposes the involvement of some organizing authority. So how could we resolve the chicken and egg quandary? Our recent excavations have shown that there were two phases of the street system at Gornia, an early one dating to the protopalatial period and a later neopalatial network. The two phases were distinguished by materials and techniques, and the dates are confirmed by ceramic evidence. We have learned that while the later street systems sometimes followed the lines of the protopalatial system, this was not always the case. In the northern area of the site, we have uncovered two long sections of the protopalatial street pavement. One section, approximately 12 meters long, runs along the north side of the pit house. 
The second stretch of protopalatial pavement runs approximately north-south for about 16 meters through the northeastern area. Neither of these streets was resurfaced in the neopalatial period. In fact, the early street in the northeastern area actually runs underneath the later neopalatial North Ridge Road, as mentioned previously. In both sections, the street pavement is made of water-worn Tripolitsa limestone co uh, cobbles, carefully selected for their intense blue-gray color. The cobbles vary in size and appear to have been placed randomly. As we shall see, this method of paving differs from the center line method of pav paving used from the Middle Minoan III period onwards. So the protopalatial town of Gornia consisted of at least five districts, each characterized by a distinct social identity and a homogenous architectural form. These are the coastal area, the Sfungara Cemetery, the House Tomb Cemetery on the northern spur of the settlement, the residential area of the town, and the new palatial civic ceremonial center. During this period, we see the introduction of the first monumental cyclopean masonry at the site, the construction of the first palace, and the establishment of a network of paved streets. But it did not mark a total break with the past. Elite families continued to use the house tombs in the North Cemetery, as if to claim continuity with the past. In other respects, the town of Gornia was starting, startlingly different in architecture and in social organization, Gornia had become more complex. Now, there was a major change in burial practices in the Middle Minoan III through Late Minoan I period. After serving for generations of elite burials, the house tombs in the North Cemetery went out of use. The slopes of Sfungaris, which had been used intermittently in the pro uh, protoplacial period, now became the major cemetery and individual burials in Pithoi, more than 150 dating to this period, in fact, replaced the communal ossuaries of the house tombs. While Boyd Haas found no evidence of Middle Minoan III activity in the palace, we now know that this was a remarkably active period. The majority of information comes from the southern end of the palace. Two significant deposits were identified in room 13. The uppermost was a late Minoan 1B feasting or drinking deposit associated with the Ashlar renovation that we will discuss shortly. On stylistic grounds, however, the lower deposit has been dated to the Middle Minoan 3A period. Three rubble walls within this space also date to the same period. Like the later late Minoan 1B remodeling deposit above it, this deposit may have commemorated a ritual feast associated with the foundations of the Middle Minoan 3A palace. The earliest levels of rooms 14, 15, and 16 all contain Middle Minoan 3 deposits in their lowest levels. In room 15, Middle Minoan 3 remains were associated with a small rubble north-south wall with plaster floors on either side. The eastern, western, and part of the southern walls of room 17 also belong to this period. A large Middle Minoan III deposit in this room may be the remains of another ritualized feast. Other parts of the new palace can also be dated to the Middle Minoan III, Late Minoan I-A period. As we have seen, the Great Tower was added to the northeast corner of the palace at this time. Built of water of water-worn Tripolitsa and conglomerate boulders, this room is a good example of the new style gray Cyclopean masonry that we will discuss in a couple minutes. Very similar gray Cyclopean walls form the eastern and southern boundaries of the palace's magazines, and that is rooms four through seven. A middle Minoan three covered drain was identified in the platea just to the south of the sacrificial slab. The drain was associated with the construction of the palace itself since it ran through the palace's facade. Excavations to the, north of the uh, to the north of the facade, underneath the large sacrificial slab, revealed a floor of stone slabs framed by wooden planks and faced with plaster. Since the drain ran up to this flooring, its original purpose may have been to keep this elaborate floor dry. Finally, the Gornia excavation project also identified a Middle Minoan III leveling deposit in the northwest corner of the platea, adjacent to the palace facade, indicating that the 500 meter square platea may have been, uh, was constructed in this period. 
In summary, the new excavations in the palace area show that the Middle Min Minoan III construction of the southern portion of the palace and the construction of the new platea were parts of the same building program. The palatial authority used the new, pl new platea as a venue for community building activities, including large-scale ritualized feasting and drinking events represented by the commemorative feasting deposits in the palace rooms closest to it. Unlike the protopalatial streets we have identified, the neopalatial street system was constructed primarily of water and of water-worn gray Tripolitsa cobbles mixed with cobbles of whiter limestone and, con and conglomerate. Some of the cobbles were hammer dressed. During a walk through the site with us, Clary Polyvu explained how this pavement was constructed. First, a central line of stones was laid, and then smaller cobbles were placed from the center line out to the house walls. This means that the street pavement was made either at the same time or after most of the house facades were in place. The center line pavement pattern was used for most of the Ridge Road, for the North-South Valley Road, and for sections of the East-West ascents that were reasonably level. The coherence of this pavement suggests that it was conceived as a single project. On the other hand, the project might have taken years to complete since it ultimately involved some 1,500 meters square of pavement. In a few places, some house facades were eventually modified, covering sections of the street pavement. When the house facades were modified, builders took care to maintain a uniform appearance suggesting that the communal appearance of the streets was valued over the individu individuality of the houses. As Palivu pointed the construction of the streets out, she also shared her thoughts on the streets as social spaces. Rather than simple boundaries dividing the site into blocks or routes connecting the various parts of the town, the streets were perhaps primarily spaces for community interaction. They were sites for talking, working and playing, places to see people and be seen. At the entrances to most of the houses, the cobbled streets provided access to similarly paved but more private vestibules that served as a liminal space between the realm of the community streets and the more private spaces within the houses. Differing from the Cyclopean masonry of the protopalatial period, which employed large irregular blocks of white crystalline limestone, that of the Middle Minoan III, um, Late Minoan I-A period, was made from large water-worn boulders of very fine-grained limestone streaked with white calcite. Called ironstone locally, the stone is properly called Tripolitsa. In these walls, the large Tripolitsa boulders are interspersed with water-worn boulders of conglomerate of roughly the same size. Many of the stones were hammer-dressed. The combination of Tripolitsa and conglomerate was also used for the neopalatial street pavements, and these also show signs of hammer-dressing. The pavement stones and the Cyclopean boulders may have come from the same source. The water-worn conglomerate boulders are helpful in identifying that source. Uh, for a while, Tripolita boulders are found all along the coast and in the riverbed west of the site, the conglomerate is less common. There is, however, one spot in the Sfungaris River Valley about 200 meters north of the town where the surrounding bedrock is conglomerate and appropriately sized water-worn boulders of Tripolita and conglomerate are found together. In summary, this style of Cyclopean masonry is definable by three separate characteristics the material, the technique, and the stone source in the Spungars River. In addition to the gray Cyclopean walls in the palace, gray Cyclopean buildings are distributed more or less evenly throughout the town, with the major part of one or two houses in each of the blocks being built in this new style of masonry, along with short sections of walls scattered through block H. <clears throat> Smaller houses filled the spaces between them. The rank distribution of houses echoes the spread of industrial equipment throughout the town. In this house, a woodworking kit, in another, textile equipment, in a third house, tools for pottery making, and so on. Not every house was equipped with the same artifacts, and each, to some extent, depended on the products of other households. Storage vessels were also distributed unevenly throughout the site. 
The distribution of the gray cyclopean masonry suggests similar interdependence among households within um, each of the blocks of houses and across the town as a whole. Zelinsky interpreted the distribution of the gray cyclopean monumental houses as an embodiment of the social structure of the town. He thought that the street network had been already laid out in the protopalatial period. During the neopalatial period, the blocks were, to use his words, subdivided, with each block having one or two cyclopean houses and a series of smaller subsidiary structures. Zelensky suggests that the blocks might have been used, or might have been based, sorry, on family kinship or clans, and that the unequal social relations within the blocks might have been roughly parallel to the client-patron relations at Pompeii. Dreesen recently proposed a similar reading of the site. He too maintains that the neopalatial street system had originally been laid out in the early protopalatial period and that resulting blocks served family-based social units at a level intermediary between that of the individual house and the town. Citing the House of Rothschild or Poe's House of Usher as illustrative parallels, Dreesen views the house as a multi-generational social institution embodying family memory and social position. Tied in some way to kinship, houses as social corporations served, in Dreesen's words, as major actors in the history of the community. Our current understanding of the neopalatial town at Gornia differs from those of Zelensky and Dreesen, primarily in some details and in matters of emphasis. We do not think that the town blocks were built as fixed units within a pre-existing street grid. Each block saw continuing, ongoing construction, and its final form was fixed only at the moment of its late Minoan 1B destruction. For example, in Block A, the earliest monumental gray cyclopean house was not House AB, which appears so prominent today, but House AC. Part of the cyclopean north facade of AC was eventually incorporated into the southeast corner of AB when the new alley was built between the two buildings. Each block at the site was similar each block at the site, sorry, has a similarly complex history that will take us an entire study season to unravel. The Neopalatial Palace was also in a more or less continual state of construction from Middle Minoan 3A through to Late Minoan 1B. Similarly, while the main part of the centerline street system was laid out as a single project, it too was subject to occasional encroachment and continual repair. Rather than seeing the streets as pre-existing boundaries, we choose to emphasize their roles as ligaments tying the community together and as places of social interaction. In this view, it is not the blocks that matter so much as social units, rather the areas in front of the houses, the face blocks. These were the primary places of social interaction. We found evidence of Middle Minoan III um, through Late Minoan 1A occupation in only two buildings in the northern area. Firstly, the westernmost building in the, in the group of four protopalatial buildings was reoccupied in the Middle Minoan III period. Secondly, a partially preserved building in the area of the later um, Minoan 1B metalworking installation was constructed in the Middle Minoan III period. Two gray cyclopean walls of this building survive. The other houses in the northern area, however, were abandoned. The only significant new structure was the first of a series of superimposed pottery kilns. What had been a part of the residential district of the town now became an industrial fringe between the edge of the town and the abandoned North Cemetery. The area surrounding the kilns was used as a dumping ground for refuse. During the Middle Minoan III through Late Minoan IA period, the town of Gornia, as we see it today, took shape. Builders undertook a number of extensive projects. The southern section of the palace was built, and along with it, the large platea. A new form of cyclopean masonry was developed for the monumental houses. At the same time, the new centerline street system was laid out using materials and techniques similar to those used in the, pal in the new palace and the monumental houses. The shift of the cemetery form um, from the ancient communal house tombs of the North Spur to the individual pithos burials of the Sfungari Cemetery may indicate that a different group of people now held authority in the town. Yet, this was also a time of contraction. 
The North House Tomb Cemetery was abandoned, as were all the proto-palatial residences in the northern part of the site. The northern area became industrial with a series of massive new kilns, and the surrounding periphery was used as a dump for pottery and construction debris. In the middle Minoan III, late Minoan IIA period, Gornia was comprised of five districts, the coastal area, the extensive Pithos Cemetery on Sphingaris, the Civic Ceremonial Centre that consisted of the expanded palace and the new platea, the residential district, and the northern industrial fringe. In the late Minoan IIB period, the Pithos Cemetery on Sphingaris Hill was abandoned. We have not found the town's late Minoan IIB cemetery. The most significant late Minoan 1B change to the palace was the addition of the ashlar masonry on the western and southern facades. The ashlar blocks brought from Akori and Maklos not only changed the appearance of the building, but probably also uh, signaled another significant social change. As Zelensky reminds us, unlike the monumental Cyclopean masonry, which was local in origin, the adoption of ashlar masonry proclaims an association with an island-wide and even international elite architectural style. Yet this did not mean a complete break with the past. We have already mentioned the massive late Minoan 1B deposit of feasting and drinking remains found in the southwest corner of the palace associated with the new ashlar renovation. Placed in the tiny room 13, directly above this deposit that marked the original Middle Minoan III construction of the south end of the palace, this later ritual deposit showed that the memory of the previous feast was still alive. At about the same time as the ashlar facades were added to the palace, the top courses of House HA, right behind it, um, were also replaced with ashlar. Souls interpreted this as an attempt to more fully incorporate the street and the platea into the palace complex. <clears throat> in our current excavations, we have learned that the pit house was renovated and reoccupied in Lake Minoan 1B, and that, a metal, and that a metal foundry was installed west of the northwest house. At this time, this northern fringe area remained largely industrial. In other parts of the site, the late Minoan 1B period was a time of further contraction. Based on their recent study of Boyd Hawes' excavation notes, Watrous and Heimroth, um, Heimroth estimated that only 33 of the 66 neopalatial houses that she had excavated had evidence of occupation in late Minoan 1B. This occupation was spread throughout much of the town, including the palace, blocks B, E, and H, and parts of blocks A, C, D, and F. If we look more closely at which particular houses continued to be occupied in late Minoan 1B, an interesting pattern emerges. Buildings with late Minoan 1B occupation include not only the palace, but also nearly all of the monumental gray Cyclopean houses in the town, along with several other smaller rubble houses. If we are right that many of the gray Cyclopean houses were among the earliest neopalatial buildings, the pattern would seem to be first in, last out, up to the moment of the late Minoan 1B destruction. Now, we have just outlined the development of Gornia over the course of a millennium. When we joined Vance Watrous's project five years ago, we would not have anticipated many parts of this story. Indeed, much of what we thought we knew about Gornia and how it developed over time has been fundamentally altered by this newest round of excavations. We realize that some of the evidence we have cited is literally circumstantial. It includes several categories of information, burials, ceramics, masonry styles, and so on, drawn from a broad area. We also realize that with two study seasons to go, the story will change. Therefore, we would like to conclude by listing several ways that the story might be proven wrong. And these include finding evidence that there was no palace in the protopalatial period, finding evidence that an extensive street system predated the construction of the first palace, finding a cyclopean wall of white crystalline um, limestone that dates to the neoplatial period, finding a gray cyclopean wall of war water-worn tripolitsa and conglomerate boulders that dates to the protopalatial period. And I would like to conclude by thanking um, both Cantan and Carl for organizing this workshop and for hosting us all. And I would also like to um, thank the following people for their help um, on some aspects of this paper. 
This includes Vance Watrous, David Blum, Kevin Glowacki, Janice Spiller, Kapua, Iyao. Thank you.